The Ethical Society is a welcoming home for humanists, a diverse, ethics-centered community of caring people dedicated to deed before creed. We seek members who embrace this ideal to join us. Each week, we ask a young member of our community to read the core values of SEEK, our Sunday Ethical Education for Kids program. Today, we don't have a child to read them, so I will do that for you. Every person is important and unique. Every person deserves to be treated fairly and kindly. I can learn from everyone. I am part of this earth. I cherish it and all the life upon it. I learn from the world around me by using my senses, mind, and feelings. I'm a member of the world community, which depends on the cooperation of all people for peace and justice. I can learn from the past to build for the future. I am free to question. I am free to choose what I believe. I accept responsibility for my choices and actions. I strive to live my values. This year, we are exploring these core values as our monthly themes. Our theme for April is I am free to question. Our platforms also include a wide variety of music to inspire us and to celebrate human diversity and creativity. Please welcome Gloria Toon and Michael Bauermeister to perform some music for us this morning. Good morning. We have a little granddaughter now, she's two, and um, I was concerned about the world that she is inheriting. I wrote this song, it's called, I'm Sorry About the Mess. Here's a song for you, little darling Cause you deserve the best And I'm sorry to have to tell you That I'm sorry about the mess I wish we could have done better but there really wasn't time And we never saw it coming We thought things would all be fine But you're young and strong and full of life And I wish you lots of luck but to tell the truth, though it sounds uncouth, we just didn't give a beep. Maybe there's another planet Maybe you can find a way Maybe you can fix the problems That are with us here today You will rise and you will triumph Or you'll stay at home and mend But I hope you find a purpose And I hope you'll find a friend And I hope you will forgive me All my love and nothing less Well, we had our fun now the party's done And I'm sorry about the mess
It's a cloudy winter Sunday Walking down a gritty street But I feel the warmth that's glowing From the people that I meet There's a guy down at the corner Worn out shoes, cardboard sign He might be part of the problem But the solution's on his mind And I hope you'll let me give you All my love and nothing less And a song to sing that won't change a thing But I'm sorry about the mess So much. We encourage members to send suggestions for music and musicians to our music director, J.D. Brooks, at jdbrooks at ethicalstl.org. We will now have opening words, an opportunity for members to share their personal thoughts and experiences. Please welcome up Dara Strickland, who will now give opening words. Thanks, Travis. Uh, I'm Dara Strickland. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. I've been a member at the Society for about three years. Today, it's going to be 75 degrees. Two days ago, snow. <laughs> this is an object lesson on why farmer's almanacs in Missouri tell you not to put new plants in the ground before April the 15th, which is later this week. Both the seasoned gardeners at the Ethical Society and those who just want their husband's climate-controlled tomato seedling biosphere to go back to being a laundry room, we're going to be busy this week. It can be so hard to wait those couple of weeks between the official beginning of spring and the last freeze, when it's actually safe to plant something new. I feel that's where we are with life after COVID, or rather, life with COVID. We'll never not be the same people who changed our lives to save our lives and protect others around us. But this isn't a week to ruminate over our long winter or to look ahead to a new frost. This is a week for cautiously, hopefully, planting to grow something new. The theme for this month's platforms is the core value, I am free to question. While we usually talk about that in relation to skepticism about a wide world of superstitions and political systems, it's also a value we can hold in a much smaller and closer way. I am free to question what I value about myself, about my life today. This week, hiding from the cold, I watched a charming little movie called About Time. It's about 10 years old, uh, and it's a comedy about love and time travel. Like all really good fantasy media, it isn't actually about the fantastic at all. It's, it's about the human. The protagonist, Tim, uh, finds out in his 21st birthday that he has the ability to relive any part of his own past and to make small changes. Like most of us would at that age, he first uses it to fix times when he put his foot in his mouth. He uses it to help a friend. He uses it to get another chance to meet the girl of his dreams for the very first time. Eventually, when Tim is more settled into who he is, he decides that the secret to living a good life is to live each day twice. The first time he lives it exactly as it is, without changing any of the annoyances or frustrations. Just before bed every night, Tim then goes back to the morning to relive the same day again. 
not to smooth out these rough edges, but to experience it all again with an attitude of joy. He chooses not to be a person with a perfect life, but to be a better friend, partner, and parent. He is completely free to question the value that every moment of his day holds. But the only thing he consistently chooses is more appreciation for what he has. We don't have fantastical time travel powers. Our choices about the boundaries of our lives are constrained by physical ability, by economics, by location, by culture. But we do have this remarkable freedom to question what we believe about ourselves in the world, and what we value. For two years, we've been waiting inside, dreaming of the spring when things will return to normal or get back to how they were. Now, when we are starting to navigate the reality of that spring, it's worth asking ourselves not only, is this safe, but also, is this valuable? It is worth using the experience of our long winter to inform deliberate interrogation about who we want to be. Flowers are already giving way to leaves on the trees. There's no denying that we're coming into a season of growth that we can enjoy more fully than we've been able to in the last two years. Don't rush this week, though, this cautious time between what we hope is the last snow and the return of warm days. This is a time for us to question what we wish to plant. Thank you so much, that was wonderful, Dara. If anyone would like to present opening words in the future, please contact James Croft or Andy Jackson. Gloria and Michael will now perform our second musical selection. So good to be here with everyone in person. Um, this song has a happy melody, and it has a sad melody, and it has some kind of sarcastic words and it has some very heartfelt words and it's just exactly how I'm feeling these days. It's <laughs> just like a real mix. So this is called Go Easy. Yes, the world is a mess. I have to admit, I'm pretty stressed. I used to always see cup half full, I've become somewhat cynical true. I'm feeling blue, sometimes I find it's the rest of the world that's on my mind. I do everything that I can do, then say a prayer. Out of the window I look up at the sky, and the light from the stars is from the beginning of time. Space goes on and on, I am a dot, I feel very small. Peace of 
Before our main address, we like to take a moment to let go of extraneous thoughts and to calm our minds and bodies. I invite you to sit comfortably and take several deep, slow breaths for one minute of mindful breathing. Thank you. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. James Croft. James is the leader of the Ethical Society of St. Louis. Leader is our term for clergy. But before he came to us, he gained his doctorate in human development and education at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. His doctoral dissertation was entitled Free Thinking, and today he will explore what freedom of thought is and why it is important. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Let me just get set up here quickly. Now, hopefully the magic will work. There we go. It is astonishing when all these things work, isn't it? So thank you to Gloria and Michael. That music was just perfect. It really touched me. So thank you very much. And thank you too, Dara. Where are you? for those beautiful opening words. I've made a note to myself, do not allow Dara to give opening words before I give platform. Because <laughs> everyone will just want to listen to her speak all morning, because I certainly did. This is Jessica Alquist. I met Jessica when I was a grad student at Harvard and a member of the humanist graduate community there. When I moved from my home, the UK, to America, I felt isolated and out of place. My intellectual style was too skeptical and contrarian for many of my American student colleagues, and I wanted to find a group of people who were equally skeptical and contrarian, and I found the humanists. We can be quite a querulous bunch. We want to question everything and not take anything on faith. So I joined that graduate community, and through them, I got involved in a lot of student activism, and that's how I met Jessica. At the time, she was 16 years old and lived with her family in Cranston, Rhode Island. Cranston is a city of 80,000 people, just south of Providence, and like St. Louis, very, very Catholic. So it's not a huge surprise, perhaps, that on the wall of her public school's auditorium hung this banner. For those who cannot read it, which I imagine will be most of you, particularly our friends on altar, it says, Heavenly Father, grant us each day the desire to do our best, to grow mentally and morally as well as physically, to be kind and helpful to my classmates and teachers, to be honest with ourselves as well as with others. Help us to be good sports and smile when we lose as well as when we win. Teach us the value of true friendship. Help us always to conduct ourselves so as to bring credit to Cranston High School West. Amen. You didn't have to say it. So I was just reading it. I wasn't leading you to say it. <laughs> Jessica, although she had been raised a Catholic, was by that time an atheist. 
and she objected to the presence of this clearly religious statement in her public school. And in 2011, after the school committee voted to keep the banner in place, the ACLU filed suit with Jessica as the plaintiff. Nine months later, the district court ruled in Jessica's favor and ordered the removal of the banner from the school. And then on February 16th, 2012, the Cranston School Committee held a public meeting to decide whether it would appeal the verdict. I was at that meeting to support Jessica, and I will never forget it. It was held in a large hall, at least as big as this one. Hundreds were in attendance, and they were very angry. It was clear that the crowd was overwhelmingly in support of keeping the prayer banner in place. And I sat with Jessica, her family, and a few friends and supporters toward the front, and I felt like we were a tiny boat surrounded by a raging sea. I remember one moment in particular, just before the formal proceedings were about to begin, when a large group of students from the school began chanting the Pledge of Allegiance, all together, loudly reciting in unison, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, and then at that moment, they all turned toward Jessica, pointed at her, and yelled, under God, and then finished indivisible with liberty and justice for all. And the message was very clear. This is a God-fearing community, and you are not a part of it. I have never more viscerally felt and understood what it means to be ostracized from a community than at that moment. Now, I've told that story many times for many audiences, and one question I often get is, why does this matter? Why does it matter if a public school hangs up a prayer banner? After all, People say the United States is an unusually religious country, and this is true. Even today, the vast majority of Americans believe in God, and this prayer is pretty general, right? It doesn't say anything about any particular God. It doesn't mention Jesus or any other prophet. So it is inclusive in a sense of a lot of different religions, it's got a lot of positive values in it that I assume anyone here would support. And if you are not religious or you don't feel included by the wording of the banner, then you can just ignore it. The presence of the banner is no big deal. Why would anyone care so much about it to take the school to court? And those are reasonable questions. But I like to turn the question around and pose it back to the questioner. Why does the presence of this prayer banner matter so much to you? Why did it matter so much that the school board incurred more than $150,000 in legal fees in their fight to keep it? Why did it matter so much to some that they repeatedly sent threats to Jessica requiring her to go to her high school with a police escort? Why did it matter so much to Rhode Island State Representative Peter Palumbo that he called Jessica an evil little thing on a local radio show? Jessica's supporters had t-shirts made and their sale funded her through college. I bought one. Why did those young students turn and point and yell at Jessica Alquist that evening at the committee meeting? If that prayer banner is just a harmless piece of school history, if it's no big deal, if it doesn't really matter, it shouldn't have been perceived as so important by their, its supporters as well. Why did they care about it so much? Well, I want to make an argument today that things like Cranston High School's prayer banner matter because fundamentally 
they're about freedom of thought, free thinking. The idea that we, each of us, has the right to our own thoughts, especially in contentious areas like religion and politics. We care, those of us who want to keep schools and other public institutions free of things like prayer banners, because we understand that when the government places its weight behind a particular set of ideas, our freedom of thought is at risk, and our freedom of thought is our most important freedom. Freedom of thought is one of our fundamental liberties. It is included as Article 18 in the United Nations Declaration on Human Rights, which reads, everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. This right includes the freedom to change their religion and belief, and freedom either alone in community with others, and in public or private, to manifest this religion in teaching, practice, worship, and observance. Now, freedom of thought can sometimes seem like a very abstract value. Unlike freedom of movement or even freedom of speech with which it's closely aligned, freedom of thought can be difficult to grasp exactly what it is. We can all imagine what it would be like to be locked in a cell and not allowed to move or for our writing to be censored. I've seen how my friends completely freak out when they are suspended from Facebook. So we know what it means to feel that our freedom of speech has been abridged. But what does it feel like to lose our freedom of thought? Can we even lose it? Our thoughts, after all, are invisible to other people. If I don't express what I'm thinking, how would anybody else know? How can anyone else stop me having a thought? No one can reach into my head and actively change what's in my mind, at least not yet. So perhaps freedom of thought doesn't need protection. Perhaps I always have my freedom of thought, whatever the circumstances. Indeed, a German free thinkers song, a famous song, popular among humanists all over the world, Gedanken sind frei, thoughts are free, expresses such a sentiment I was going to, shall I sing it? I was going to read the text. I'll sing it. But you have to be kind. Ahem. Die Gedanken sind frei, wer kann sie erraten? Sie fliegen vorbei wie nächtliche Schatten. Kein Mensch kann sie wissen, kein Jäger sie schießen. Es bleibt dabei, die Gedanken sind frei. Yes! I was nervous about that. What does that mean in English? It means... Thoughts are free. Who can guess them? They fly by like nocturnal shadows. No person can know them. No hunter can shoot them. And so it will always be. Thoughts are free. So my thoughts are unguessable. No one can know them, so they are always free. And a later verse puts it even more clearly. If I am thrown into the darkest dungeon, all these are futile works because my thoughts fear, tear, I'm sorry, my thoughts tear all gates and walls apart. Thoughts are free. So by the idea of this song, really, you can't attack someone's freedom of thought. They always have it, whether they're in a dungeon, whatever people do, your thoughts can do whatever they like. So perhaps freedom of thought is absolute. It's unabridgeable. I don't see it that way, though. In fact, I think freedom of thought is, along with being basic, the nexus of all freedom, hard won and easily lost. And I believe that so passionately that, as you heard, I spent years of my life writing a doctoral thesis about it, defending the idea that free thinking is central to all human freedom. Now, don't worry. I am not going to rerun my defense of my doctoral dissertation for you this morning. I briefly considered it, but I decided to spare you. So you got lucky. But I do want to try and convey the central idea if I can. 
that freedom of thought is the linchpin of all human freedom because freedom at root is the ability to choose between different life options that we value. And the ability to make rational choices between different options requires freedom of thought. Now, that's quite a lot, so I'm going to unpack it a bit for you. And to do that, I have to introduce the work of an, a philosopher who was central to my thinking on this, the Indian philosopher Amartya Sen. Here he is. He is famous for many things. He has a Nobel Prize in economics among his countless honors. But the thing which stands out for me is what is called his capability theory. Capability theory is a peculiar understanding of human freedom which has been very influential and which I think helps illustrate the centrality of freedom of thought in all our lives, which is why I employed it in my dissertation. What is capability theory? Well, basically, Sen argues that freedom should be seen not simply as the legal right to do something, nor as the absence of any restraints against you doing something, but as your actual ability to choose between different ways of living life. Freedom should be conceived, he writes, as the ability we have to lead the kind of lives we have reason to value. So his view is in opposition to views of freedom which consider a person free if they have a political right to do something or are not being restrained from doing something by an outside agent. Sen says, rather, we are free only to the extent that we can actually choose to do the things we want to do. So it's quite a forceful and big concept of freedom. So here's an example. Say, for instance, we want to ask, what does it mean to be free in the area of eating? Sen says that our substantive freedom in this area is defined by our ability to choose between different food options. So for a country which provides its citizens all with healthy food to eat, but nothing else, that country is certainly doing something good, but it's not fully promoting freedom in the area of eating, because to have freedom, we must be able to choose between eating healthy food, unhealthy food, no food if we want to go on a hunger strike or a fast, etc. And it's in the choice between different options that our freedom resides. So in order to further elucidate his theory, this is where it gets a little technical, and you can skip over this bit if it's too much, but Sen introduces the ideas of a functioning and a capability. A functioning, according to Sen, reflects the various particular things a person might value doing or being. So they might be very simple, like being adequately nourished or being able to take part in the life of a community. Things that you might wish to do. So functionings, in essence, are things that we might want to do and that we are able to actually achieve. So in the area of food, like eating the pizza on the screen, that would be a functioning. But capabilities, by contrast, are combinations of functioning which a person is able to choose between. They are the collection of all their options in a particular area of life. So a wealthy person in a society like ours, which offers many culinary options, can choose between stuffing themselves with pizza every night, as I would like to do, or never eating it. They can choose to eat at a five-star restaurant or going to McDonald's. They can choose from a massive range of options. And so they have a large amount of freedom in the area of eating. And that's their capability. So as Sen puts it, capability is the substantive freedom to achieve alternative functioning combinations. I've made that into a slide. It's awful. OK? <laughs> So here are three functionings, and the whole set of functionings is the capability in the area of food. These slides actually are from my dissertation defense, <laughs> so you do get a little bit of a taste of how riveting it was. So our freedom in the area of food means being able to choose 
vegetarianism or paleo or to fast for religious reasons or whatever. We actually have to be able to do those things. It's not for sin an abstract thing or merely a legal right. We actually have to be able to make those real choices to be free in that area of our lives. Am I making anyone hungry? I'm making myself hungry. Now, perhaps some of you can already guess why I use this model as the starting point for my work on autonomy. It's because it puts evaluating and choosing options right at the center of what it means to be free. If what it means to be free is to be able to lead the kind of lives we have reason to value, to select between a wide range of functionings that we're able to choose in every area of life, then the ability to choose to make decisions for ourselves about what we value and how to pursue what we value is an inherent part of the exercise of every freedom. So to use this even worse slide, <laughs> to be free in the area of eating is to have a choice between a wide range of different foods, and so being able to make that choice for ourselves, being able to construct a hierarchy of values that guides that choice, being able to weigh the different options and intelligently determine which ones of them would move us towards what we value and which wouldn't, is an essential component of being free. And that's what I call autonomy or free thinking. If we don't have the ability to weigh different options, to come up with a hierarchy of values, then we can't make intelligent choices that move us towards the life we want to live, and therefore we are unfree. The point becomes clearer, I fervently hope, if we consider a more profound freedom than freedom to choose what we eat. So let's consider freedom of religion. And let's just add the happy human of humanism to this slide. Apologies to anyone of the Baha'i faith, which I just covered up with the happy human. What is religious freedom exactly? Well, following the model I've presented, perhaps some of you can guess, it is not simply the right to practice your religion. But I argue freedom of religion is the ability to develop a concept of the religious good for yourself and to intelligently choose between religious options that move towards that good. So the freedom of religion is not in the practice of any given religious faith, not just there. It's in the ability to choose between them, to live into the one of the range of options which we decide serves us best. And that means that there is an essential mental component of religious freedom, a thinking part of it. So consider I might have the material resources and political rights necessary to choose between different religions to belong to, but not the intellectual faculties required to make an intelligent choice the knowledge, the dispositions, the intellectual abilities that would enable me to evaluate what my religious goals are and which religion might help me meet those goals. I might, for instance, have grown up in the United States with plenty of money and with all the political freedoms that are afforded members of this political community, but have been raised in a family that only taught me about one religion. So I didn't know that any others even existed. Is that person free in the area of religion? Do they have religious freedom just because the Constitution says they does? Says they does? Says they do? I would say no. They don't because they don't have a meaningful choice. And they don't have a meaningful choice because they don't know the range of options. It's cognitive. There's an intellectual component to it. And I think the same is true of every freedom. Every freedom has this choice component at the heart of it and that means that freedom of thought is central. Now, this might sound obvious to you. I kind of hope it does. You might be thinking, James went to Harvard for eight years to come up with this, this slide? But in my defense, this view of freedom is hardly standard in philosophy. It's controversial. And many people in practice do not accept it. 
So for instance, a parent who seeks to raise their child in their own religion often feels that they are exercising their own religious freedom. It's their right, they think, as a component of their religious freedom to raise their children in such a way that their children will take on their own beliefs. That's how they understand religious freedom. It's a very widespread view. But my view of autonomy and freedom says no. A parent has no right to raise their children in such a way that their child will unproblematically take on their own beliefs because the child has the same right to choose their own religion that the parent hopefully has exercised. The freedom is not in the practice of a particular religious path, but in the ability to choose between them, and parents frequently abridge their children's freedom by effectively choosing for them. And I say that's not right. A parent's responsibility toward their child is not to raise them with their own religious tradition, but to expose them to multiple religious options and enable them to choose. In other words, to develop their freedom of thought. And the same is true in every area of our lives. Our responsibility to our children is to enhance their range of options and enable them to make decisions between them. So I hope that you can see how freedom of thought, free thinking, is central to all our freedoms. And it's central to ethical humanism, the tradition we celebrate and practice here as well. Felix Adler, he always looks creepy in photos. There is not one good photo of Felix Adler on the planet. I have looked. He is the founder of the first ethical society, and he was a prominent proponent of freedom of thought, one of the progenitors of the contemporary free thought movement, in fact. He was for years the president of the Free Religious Association, a body of religious radicals and dissenters who sought to replace dogmatic religions of the past with new philosophies based on rationality and individual conscience. In fact, in preparation for this platform, I discovered this charming cartoon, which actually features Felix Adler on the left of the cartoon there, you will see Adler and his fellow freethinkers are assaulting a castle with a flag that reads medieval dogmatism. And here he is with his bald head and um, beard at the Gatling gun. The gun is called Enlightenment. <laughs> its barrels are inscribed with the words history, archaeology, evolution, geology, and he's aiming it at a marauding band of clerics who are carrying a banner saying, believe or be damned. The free thinkers banner, by contrast, reads, think or be damned. It's a heavy-handed metaphor. <laughs> and it, it's actually not very accurate to Adler's real beliefs, because Adler was not, in fact, so much like a 19th century Richard Dawkins. His message was one of respect for people's religious views as long as those views resulted in work towards the collective liberation of humankind. And in fact, in the address he gave at the founding of the first ethical society, he said, for more than 3,000 years, people have quarreled concerning the formulas of their faith. The earth has been drenched with bloodshed in this cause. There have been no direer wars than religious wars, no bitterer hates than religious hates, and for what? Are we any nearer to unanimity? On the contrary, diversity within the churches and without has never been so widespread as at present. Sects and factions are multiplying on every hand, and every new schism is but the parent of a dozen others. And it must be so. Let us make up our minds to that. The freedom of thought is a sacred right of every individual, and diversity will continue to increase with the progress, refinement, and differentiation of the human intellect. But if difference be inevitable, nay, welcome in thought, 
There is a sphere in which unanimity and fellowship are above all things needful. Believe or disbelieve as ye list. We shall at all times respect every honest conviction, but be one with us where there is nothing to divide. In action, diversity in the creed, unanimity in the deed. This is that common ground where we all may grasp hands, united in humankind's common cause. He could write really well, couldn't he? To Adler, the enemy wasn't religion itself, any specific religious idea. The enemy was dogmatism, the conviction that there is only one right idea, that truth is fixed and we have found it and everyone should be forced to believe it. That's what free thinkers have always been against what Adler was against, and what our tradition today is still against. That is why our tradition has always championed free thinking. And that's why to this day, in our own Sunday Ethical Education for Kids program, in accordance with the ideas that I've presented this morning, we do not try to force our kids to accept a single set of religious views but rather introduce them to a range of perspectives. Our hope is not that they all become good little atheists with copies of Christopher Hitchens and Sam Harris in their book bags, but they will develop the faculties to choose a religious path for themselves. We want to develop their, cap their capability in the area of freedom of religion, if we want to use that technical language. We recognize, in the words of poet Khalil Gibran, your children are not your children. They are the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. They come through you, but not from you. And though they are with you, yet they belong not to you. You may give them your love, but not your thoughts for they have their own thoughts. You may strive to be like them, but seek not to make them like you. You may give them your love, but not your thoughts, for they have their own thoughts. That is the essence of free thinking, the belief that everyone has the right to their own thoughts, because only through equipping people to have their own thoughts are we truly free. And that is, oh, I forgot to show you Khalil Gibran. Oh, well. And that is why the prayer banner which Jessica Alquist fought to remove actually matters. Because it subtly but persistently promoted the idea that there is only one right way to think. By embedding a prominent religious message in a state school, an arm of the government, after all, the government itself is seen to endorse one religious perspective, one in which God exists, can be referred to as Heavenly Father, and prayed to using prayers ending in Amen. While this may seem to some a small thing to get worked up about, I hope that what I've said today explains why it is significant. Because free thinking is at the heart of all our liberties. Even slight pressures upon it can affect everything else. Our religious beliefs, our beliefs of conscience, our repositories of values which orient us toward the world, they have the potential to shape our entire lives. So even small hints of dogmatism should be avoided. The prayer banner with its heavenly father, the reciting of the Pledge of Allegiance with its under God, the introduction of Bible study classrooms into public school curricula as is being attempted again at this legislative session in Jeff City. All these are attempts to prevent our children thinking free and should be opposed because they thereby threaten every other freedom. Even a light hand 
upon the shoulder of our minds has the potential to restrict every choice we make. So let us honor the legacy of our movement and protect freedom of thought for our children and for ourselves. Thank you. This is really hard. Thank you very much, James. If you are moved to make a donation today, we appreciate anything you may be able to offer. We rely on generosity of our members and friends to ensure our community can keep providing our many free programs. If you don't have cash today with you, you can donate at ethicalstl.org forward slash donate, or you can use that QR code on the screen. Or even be better, you can become a pledging member. We would love to keep you informed about future events at Ethical Society of St. Louis. If you'd like to join our society, uh, or if you'd like to rather receive our weekly newsletter, you can also use the next QR code that'll come up uh, to uh, see that. And while our ushers are taking our collection, you, we will now have our final musical selection. Cloudy afternoon, Missouri, midwinter Three inches of snow on the ground The trees black and still in the cold air The smell of their wet bark leaves rattling sound Coyote walks slowly, so tired It's been four days since his last meal Wet footprints on the warm rock Catch his eye and his nose Here it is, I've been waiting Not any too soon Everything comes when I need it Never too late or too soon It's the coyote life and a mouth night to night From the warmth of the sun To the howl at the moon The rabbit moved once in the bushes That motion his only mistake Coyote takes store of his body Just one chance he has Life and death are at stake Rabbit turns his back Coyote bounces Every muscle in his body in two The teeth at the neck The struggle is over Another few nights now to howl at the moon Everything comes when I need it Never too late or too soon It's the coyote life And a mouth night to night from the warmth of the sun to the howl of the moon. Slow month in the woodworker's trade. All my chisels are perfectly sharpened. As I turn to the help wanted page, the station wagon pulls into my driveway. We need a table to seat eight kids. Can you fit us in your schedule? Can we leave you a deposit? Why do I worry? It happens like this Everything comes when I need it Never too late or too soon It's the coyote life Hand to mouth night to night From the warmth of the sun To the howl at the moon Everything comes when I need it 
never too late to sing. It's a coyote life and a mouse night tonight. From the warmth of the sun to the howl of the wind. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to skip things around. We put the um, announcements at the end. Uh, first, a discussion of the platform address will be held right here in this room. So we uh, welcome you to stick around and ask your questions. Alternatively, you may wish to attend a program from our Climate Action Now team, The Problem with Plastics. That's happening today at 1115, live in the Hanky Room, which is the room underneath the stairs over there on the west side. Um, also on Zoom, it's available. Learn how to use how single-use plastics, not how to use them, we don't want those. Uh, learn how single-use plastics and plaster production are major contributors to climate change and what you can do to reduce plastic use to lessen their negative impact on the environment. Uh, or if you'd prefer to hang out and make friends with new people, uh, join us downstairs for coffee. If you're new and would like people to say hi, please pick up a yellow mug. Finally, an attractive Ethical Society yard sign can be yours. Purchase your sign after platform in the foyer. We're asking for a $10 donation so you can show your Ethical Society pride. To end our program, I invite you to greet those on either side of you. Uh, I wish you all a great week. Thank you.